object sites are all characteristics of extractivism. Rights such as the right to water, the right to food, and the right to adequate housing are most often violated by these extractive projects. Cases are well documented in Asia and Africa. So by reading the reports, you'll be better informed about the problems that forest dependent communities face. In addition, the presentation that we will listen very soon will share light on the issue. Dear participants, we will hear different presentations. The main presentation and a video screening will be followed each by the presentation of the case studies to give more example of the impacts of extractive projects. Alison, the speaker, will speak to bring the gender aspects of the impact of extractives on forests and indigenous people and local communities livelihoods. She will demonstrate the suffering that the women and other gender groups experience in the face of extractive projects. Her presentation will followed by the Armenia, Liberia and Kyrgyzstan case studies presentation. So in the second part of this uh, uh, presentation uh, series, we will watch a video from Armenia showing the impacts of extractive projects on communities, especially on women. After the video, we will listen to the presentation of the India case study and the impacts of BRI Belt and Road Initiative on forests and forest dependent communities with emphasis on the impacts on women. After all the presentations, you will have the floor to make comments, to put forward your reflections and ask questions. By the way, once uh, the presenter is presenting, you can also send your questions uh, in the chat. So the webinar will be then closed by a concluding remark from Valentina, uh, the gender justice campaign coordinator. I hope Valentina is, is here. So ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, allow me to give the floor to Alice. Alice is uh, a researcher and also uh, an expert on gender issues, working with the uh, Global Forest Coalition uh, together with me. So Alison, you have the floor for your presentation. Please, 25 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kwame. Um, it's nice to be here with everybody. Um, and I think, Chatira, if you could share um, the slides. Um, I can jump yes, right in. Just one second. Yeah, no problem. Right. Can you all see the presentation? Looks good to me. Great. Thank you so much. I was having troubles with mine, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I just wanted to start off by I chose this image because of uh, I believe it's a gold mine in Greece because how it seemingly mi mimics mycelium, the underground body of fungi or, or mushrooms that um, has a deep symbiotic relationship with trees and forests. This juxtaposes the way that extractivism engages with forests through the destruction of not only trees, but all that is connected to um, the forests and the forest well-being, including non-human animals, plants, mycelium, but also importantly, people. So intersectional feminism argues about how all power structures are deeply connected, um, which is also an argument made in this issue. Colonization, capitalism, extractivism, gender oppression, racism, and et cetera, all deeply connected. And so the reaching tendrils of development of this mind, for example, impact all people differently. Um, the most deeply affected are women and gender diverse people, specifically indigenous and other forest dependent people. 
However, in the end, it all comes for us all. So I just, a brief description of this image. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So all beings rely on forests and forest diversity for survival. Um, while the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 15 outlines the need to protect and restore ecosystems and forests, as well as halt and reverse land degradation and biodiversity loss, um, extractivism is still continuing to contribute to forest loss on a large scale. Uh, this is important to note because forests shelter the majority of terrestrial biodiversity. And while deforestation is slowing somewhat, forest cover is still in decline each year. So extractive systems in general affect uh, forests either directly or indirectly. And these include uh, mining, tree plantations, oil and gas exploration, and large scale monoculture. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So what exactly is extractivism broadly? Um, it's a concept that's been around for over 500 years um, and it sort of broadly refers to the process of extracting large volumes of natural resources for export markets. Um, however, it's deeply entangled and entrenched with global capitalism at local and global levels. And these systems um, can be owned publicly, privately, or by the state. However, it has been created through and perpetua uh, perpetuated by colonization, including through chattel slavery uh, and neocolonization. So I included this picture because that's often left out of the analysis. Um, it's part of a system of power and a way of organizing life that contributes to destructive organization of life through hierarchization and non-reciprocity. So we cannot look at extractivism solely as resource extraction, but we must look at it through the hierarchies of power it perpetuates and, uh, it, and generates. And this extends to gender oppression, racism, poverty, and more. It's a system of concentration of capital and wealth and resources for some at the expense of the total destruction and poverty for others. Um, and it has influenced global capitalism in, on multiple levels. So any analysis of capitalism must take into account the horrors of extractivism. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's also a really big correlation between monetary poverty and richness of resources. Uh, so the states that rely most on raw material exports are often less monetary we monetarily wealthy. And this is especially true for those who have faced historical colonization, and they are continually made in, um, especially vulnerable and often are forced to provide for their former and current colonizers. Um, so I'm from Canada. I'm just going to bring up this example to bring it to my personal level. Um, I think an estimated around uh, half of the world's publicly listed mines are in Canada, a large amount overseas. Um, and so Canadian companies who go abroad to these less wealthy countries to exploit them um, profit immensely while the places they exploit from suffer. However, Canada is also a settler colonial country uh, based on the dispossession of Indigenous lands. And so there's a lot of mining and pipeline construction that directly impacts Indigenous communities um, usually against their will, um, these companies will, and, and state-owned um, processes will unilaterally go into these communities and exploit and poison the land without fair consultation. And even if there is consultation, does not listen to the, the no that was given to them. Um, next slide, please. And so while forests and forest biodiversity in decline, it's important to uh, recognize that forests are not they don't exist in isolation. Um, forests harbor life cultures and knowledge that is necessary and integral to the protection of the land that is disappearing due to forced displacement and violence. All extractive industries in some way impact forest and forest communities. Um, and so these places that are interwoven with these specific cultural knowledges um, have been nurtured since time immemorial are being destroyed and flooded by ceaseless, ceaseless sorry, excuse me, drives for growth. Um, the majority of indigenous communities also live in or around forests or uh, rural areas. And they also steward, according to the UN, approximately 80% of all of Earth's biodiversity. 
So given that the biggest threat to biodiversity and indigenous ways of life is extractivism, we need to pay attention to this. Um, those who are directly impacted by extractive uh, violence are generally majority world, so global south um, um, people, women and gender diverse people, and they're also usually excluded from global and local decision making processes, so they don't really have any say. In addition to this, when these uh, extractive systems and uh, decisions are being made, um, community div divisions are also created. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in addition to this, the most economically valuable lands are usually uh, the ones that are first to be exploited, leaving behind the least valuable lands for um, marginalized communities um, until, of course, those lands are deemed valuable, in which case it just continues. Um, however, women are generally uh, the people who engage with these places in uh, non-economic ways. So through gathering wood, seed and medicinal plants or, or food, um, they're dependent on these places. Um, they are most directly and often severely impacted by extractivism, extractivist systems that forcibly displace them. In addition to this, once extractivism uses the land and makes it uninhabitable, the system just moves on to the next place to use up. So even on the base of it, this is by definition unsustainable. Um, next slide, please. So I think a lot of people often wonder why gender is an important aspect of this. And I think I touched on it briefly about how it's all connected to a larger scheme of oppression, um, biodiversity loss, and et cetera. But also importantly, women and gender diverse people are frequently knowledge keepers and very important members of their groups. And they are forced to leave their ancestral homes to keep their family and community alive, uh, risking loss of generational stories interconnected with these lands. Um, not only this, but they are frequently murdered for defending their homes um, and are frequently the ones leading the um, front lines of environmental protection, which puts them further at risk. So violence uh, stemming from extractivism, which will be explored a bit further on, um, disproportionately affects women and Indigenous people who are already made vulnerable through systemic inequalities that have existed. Um, often when examining impacts on the environment and um, climate change, there's often no uh, consistent gender responsiveness guidelines um, and stereotyping is still common. So women are generally seen as static victims um, with no agency and gender divergence is completely left out. Um, so we're really trying to avoid that. Um, and it's really important that we have a gender analysis included. Um, next slide, please. So feminism um, addresses this in many ways and is unnecessary for any complete analysis of extractive systems. Um, there are two kinds of strands of feminism, um, ecofeminism and feminist political ecology. And they both explore the historical connection between the oppressive domination of women as well as the oppressive domination of nature. Um, so ecofeminism and FPE, feminist political ecology, I'll just shorten it, um, examine how nature is often produced as feminine so that the door is open for destructive industry, which is often seen as masculinized. Um, under extractive systems that rely on patriarchy, uh, both women and nature can be used and dominated. So anyone who deviates from these norms that were created through these oppressive systems, um, essentially those that were further away from European whiteness and maleness are discriminated against under this model. And those who are painted as closer to nature are seen as underdeveloped and, underdeveloped and in need of development. Um, this all stems from colonization and was a justification for the mass dispossession of land in Canada, for example, uh, everywhere else as well. Um, gender as a whole was partly, the way it is understood today, it was partly uh, introduced and used to destroy indigenous cosmologies as well in order to civilize. Um, 
forcing people into feminized and masculinized roles, um, as well as the violent deviation from these gender roles. Um, so ultimately, the control of women and gender diverse people spills over into extractivism. Um, why, and that is why, sorry, ecofeminism and FPE both uh, should be used to critique these uh, systems of oppression. They provide a lens to co-create alternatives and solutions um, through place-based alternatives. And it's important to apply this intersectional lens, again, going back to the connection of everything, um, just to see how intricate this web is and how much harm it does and how you cannot separate gender from race, class, ethnicity, religion, caste, and, and everything else, um, and how they're all deeply connected. <clears throat> Uh, next, please. Next slide. Um, so going more deeply into how extractivism um, affects women. Um, with extractivist processes, violence inevitably occurs. Um, and this violence uh, disproportionately affects women in multiple ways. There's an increase in sexual violence, domestic violence, racism, and, and a lot more with the introduction of extractivism. Uh, there's a lot of reports that show that when um, uh, extractivist systems and, and man camps or any other name for it go into remote cities, there is a, a high uptick in sexual life violence. And this um, affects rural communities and rural women, as well as Indigenous uh, women who are already facing higher levels of <clears throat> sexualized violence in general. Um, women are also forced to engage in unpaid domestic and community labor and are subject to dangerous forms of sex work and um, trafficking that come into the community with extractivism. Um, oftentimes women are not even consulted at all um, before these systems come in. So their, their voice is not valued and they do not benefit from any of the new jobs that come in for the most part. <clears throat> also um, related to that, any environmental impacts that happen. So the poisoning of water or chemicals that leak into systems disproportionately affect people who breastfeed um, as well as children. So they're <clears throat> impacted physically, excuse me, um, physically as well. Um, because women generally lead the resistance, um, they're also put at higher risk for violence. And not all women are impacted equally. As discussed before, Indigenous women face the compounded burden of being a woman as well as being Indigenous. Um, maybe you've heard of this, but missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and two-spirited people. Um, it's more often used in North America, but it applies to the whole world. Um, women and gender diverse pe Indigenous people generally face increased <coughs> risk. Sorry, I'm losing my voice a bit. Increased risk of violence in general. Um, extractive industry has been shown to increase this risk. Um, indigenous women also face the compounded burden of defending the survival of their cultures and languages and communities and children um, in the face of the continued colonization and displacement um, from their communities. Um, they also lack access to adequate health care, um, any safety, and face increased monetary poverty. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Um, next slide, please. Um, so with extractive uh, processes, violence increases in general. Um, and um, while indigenous people are not historically um, responsible for the negative environmental impacts, they are first to feel the repercussions of um, extractivism, but also at the, they face a much higher violence rates at the hands of uh, governments um, and are um, around the world are incarcerated at very high rates as well for all genders. Um, and according to a report by Frontline Defenders, 69% um, of 331 Frontline Defenders were reported murdered, who were reported murdered, sorry, were defending Indigenous land and environmental rights. 25% of those who were murdered were Indigenous, um, and that's in juxtaposition to the 6% of the world who is considered Indigenous. 
Um, Global Witness also reported that between 2015 and between 2019, more than one third of frontline defenders were indigenous. <clears throat> I found all these stats uh, via cultural survival, by the way. Um, ultimately, indigenous people um, often live and rely on <clears throat> forests for livelihoods and survival, but so does the rest of the world. And the violence that comes from extractivism um, through loss of biodiversity, through violence against indigenous people and indigenous women affects us all in the end. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, next slide, please. Um, there's also a fundamental difference between how many indigenous cultures view nature versus how um, the dominant um, system views nature. Um, seeing life as just resources to be used detracts the life from these items that are being produced. Um, this allows exploitative conceptions of nature to allow uh, extractivism to continue to thrive. Being severed from any sacred and land-based knowledges has created a very deep cultural alienation that's bringing us closer and closer to destruction. Um, accumulating resources through extractive, extractivism um, cannot continue at this rate, and we must work to reconceptualize our relationship with the natural world in general. Um, so indigenous people came together in, from around the world, came together in 1992 um, for the indigenous people's earth charter. And this examines how that in order to heal humanity and the world and the systems that are destroying it, we need to heal ourselves from the destructive path that we are still on. They came together to affirm, I guess reaffirm, that nature has agency of its own. And the indigenous people struggle to reclaim lands that have thrived historically because of their care um, needs to occur. Extractivists processes, companies, and states that unilaterally go into indigenous territories, as well as those who fund these systems uh, directly undermine indigenous and land sovereignty. Uh, next page, please. Um, I included this picture just to show the connection. I know it's just an American example, but this is true pretty much everywhere. If you look at these maps, the connection between um, Indigenous displacement and uh, loss of old growth forest. <clears throat> so if you look at the map, you can see how much old growth forest existed before colonization or during colonization, dispossession increased the amount of, sorry, decreased the amount of old growth forest by a very significant amount. Um, so given that most intact biodiversity, I'm so sorry, um, is located where Indigenous people are, uh, reframing extractivism's distorted take on life is imperative at this point. Um, so nature-derived guidance, um, which is examined by Indigenous Climate Action, includes spending deep time in relation to the land and relearning how to be in good relationship with it. So returning to respect and reverence for the natural world also necessitates gender equity across the world as the exploitative way of viewing nature and women is something that can be uh, dominated, go hand in hand. And there are some perspectives around the world, I'm sure there's many in different languages as well, but the rights of nature and land back, which is uh, more specific to where I'm from, um, are imperative to healing our relationships with um, the planet. Um, they affirm that the planet itself and the land is autonomous and self-determining and that harmony and reciprocal relationships are necessary to shift our relations with um, the land from something to be exploited into a more holistic understanding of human and nature relations. Um, this has been affirmed by a few international um, bodies, the World Parks Congress and the UN <clears throat> and other frameworks have begun to recognize and affirm indigenous, uh, affirm, sorry, indigenous knowledge and rights. Um, the WPC is the largest gathering related to the future uh, protected areas globally. Um, and this is important because historically indigenous people have been left out of decision-making processes or completely displaced from their territories in order to protect these lands. Um, ironically, because they had been stewarding and protecting these lands since time immemorial. But the w WPC has since recognized that 
the earth cannot be parceled out in such a way. And I think that's a very important <clears throat> um, revelation in um, policy. Um, they deemed indigenous rights as uh, to their territory as a prerequisite to earth protection. Um, and through the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, the UN has recognized Indigenous rights, sovereignty and equality as being imperative, as well as declared um, Indigenous knowledge, cultures and practices as important for the well-being of the environment. The conversation needs to start here. Um, rather than viewing Indigenous peoples and women's involvement as add-ons, um, we need to start there. And it's an incredibly important that we look at this from a, a way that sees everything is connected. Um, next slide, please. So as I come to a close, I guess, um, I just wanted to point out a few more things that maybe I, I left out is that Indigenous knowledge from Indigenous groups is necessary and women and gender diverse uh, voices are imperative in extractivism um, processes and critiquing extractivism processes. The co-construction of knowledge and knowledge sharing um, is important. And through this knowledge sharing, we also ensure that the entire burden of climate collapse does not fall solely on the shoulders of those who are the most deeply impacted. <clears throat> Resisting extractivism is a job that we should all engage in and do what we can. Um, and protecting forests and forest dependent people is imperative to protecting biodiversity and cultural diversity. Um, I kind of chose this image to juxtapose the first one I, I put, this is actual mycelium, um, to emphasize how multiple experiences and people coming together creates webs of chain. Um, and I hope that in listening to the case studies that follow, you see how they're all connected to the bigger picture as well. Thank you a lot for listening. And I'm sorry I'm a bit sick, but <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much, um, Alison, for your brilliant presentation. And thank you for reminding us that extractivism is uh, the system that accumulates wealth and also that destroy forests and livelihoods. Thank you again for your presentation. Forests are sacred for us. We'll now move on to um, Nazali for um, Armenia presentation. Nazali, please get the floor and uh, give us a short presentation of uh, the case study from uh, Armenia. And uh, um, yeah, be straightforward, please. Thank you so much. Nazali, you have the floor. Здравствуйте, я рада вас приветствовать. У меня есть проблемы с видео, поэтому презентацию трудно мне показать, но так как после этого вы увидите фильм, я думаю, все будет понятно. Значит, я хочу представить ситуацию, связанную с с горной добывающей промышленностью, которая э, начала свою деятельность около курортного города Джермук. Э, это лечебная вода Джермук и э, республиканский курорт, э, куда люди приезжают лечиться и отдыхать. Э, весь город окружен лесами. Эта зона считается эмиральной зоной и охраняется Бернской конвенцией. И очень много там редких краснокнижных видов растений и животных. И поэтому эта зона, кроме того, что эмираль зона, эта территория считается заказником. То есть это по нескольким конвенциям считается Джермук охраняемым городом, охраняемой территорией, природной территорией. Несмотря на все это, в 2009 году наше правительство дало разрешение на разработку золота. Хотя там золота очень мало, в одной тонне 0,7 грамм золота. Однако с 1954 -го года этот э, рудник был зарегистрирован в геофонде республики как э, урановый и ториевый, ториевый рудник. То есть это э, очень высокая опасность радиации. 
До 2012 -го года они ничего не делали, только получали разрешение, хотя у них уже было в 2009 году разрешение на разработку. И в 2012 году они первые, первые работы начали в 2012 году и сняли верхний покров земли. После этого, когда люди увидели, что поднимается пыль, шум, были повреждены трубопровод питьевой воды, который снабжал село Гандевас, и вся грязная вода пошла через трубопровод в дома жителей села Гандевас. Тогда люди начали протестовать против этого рудника. До этого мы встречались с жителями, но они не верили, что кто-то даст разрешение на разработку этого рудника. Но когда уже фактически они увидели, что какой вред причиняется и городу, и их сельскохозяйственным землям, в это время начали покупать земли по очень низкой цене. Очень много коррупционных рисков, и сейчас введены уголовные дела по продаже этих земель. Люди потеряли, вот сельские жители, например, села Гандевас, они потеряли свои пастбища, луга. 1500 семей потеряли свои сельскохозяйственные земли. То есть это все было изъято для горнорудной промышленности. То есть это подействовало на уровень жизни этих людей. А в Джермуке там нет сельского хозяйства, потому что Джермук находится на уровне 2100 метров над уровнем моря. И э, э, дефицит э, кислорода э, компенсируется только зелеными насаждениями, лесами и чистым воздухом. Если эти леса э, будут повреждены, если э, начнется горнорудная промышленность и загрязнится воздух, то там будет просто невозможно жить. И в основном все жители города Джермука, они вовлечены э, в сферу сервиса. То есть э, э, дети, которые оканчивают Джермукскую школу, они поступают в те учебные заведения, которые связаны с медициной, с туризмом и с сервисом. Там людей, которые могут работать в горной рудной промышленности, нет. Поэтому все работники должны быть привезены из других районов. Даже многие были приглашены с других стран многие работники, которые работали в строительных работах. В 2016 году начали строительные работы уже, и в результате этого люди почувствовали, что число туристов снизилось, потому что уже видно было, что и пыль поднимается, и шум, и многие гостиницы были взяты в аренду вот, для рабочих горно-рудной промышленности, и люди потеряли свою работу, то есть врачи, медсестры, обслуживающий персонал, который в основном женщины, они потеряли свои работы. То есть четыре гостиницы были арендованы компанией «Лидия», которая зарегистрирована в офшорной зоне и не платит ни здесь налоги, ни, ни там. И очень трудно отслеживать, кто реальный, реально получает прибыль от этого бизнеса и кто участвует реально в этом бизнесе. И многие женщины потеряли свои работы. Многие женщины собирают лечебные травы, грибы, ягоды и продают туристам. То есть это очень короткий сезон, за который они могут немножко подработать, используя, используя природные ресурсы, такие как лечебные травы, и сдают свои квартиры туристам 2-3 месяца. И в течение года они используют вот 
ту сумму, которую они заработали в течение двух-трех месяцев. За два-три года они потеряли э, э, тот доход, который получался с туристического бизнеса, э, и э, вся пыль... Э, загрязнили вот эти лесные и э, природные территории, и невозможно было ничего собирать, потому что эти лечебные травы, они стали уже не лечебными, а наоборот, и никто не покупал. То, что э, творилось в селе Гандевас, там в основном абрикосовые сады, и большинство этих садов было вырублено весной, когда они цвели, то есть это тоже говорит о моральном облике этой компании. И люди потеряли э, в этом смысле доход свой. И, э, а те сады, которые э, остались, э, они, э, их урожай невозможно было использовать, потому что вся пыль лежала на этих абрикосов, и она не отмывалась. Поэтому весь урожай за два года, когда шло строительство, все было выброшено. Ничего они не смогли продать. Поэтому уровень бедности рез, резко возрос. И в течение этих двух лет э, резко выросли э, уровень э, число онкологических заболеваний. Если раньше это э, число было э, незначительным, и даже некоторые годы вообще не наблюдались онко онкологические заболевания в этом регионе, то э, с начала строительства, строительных работ повысилось повысилось количество онкозаболеваемости, и в основном тоже были подвержены дети и женщины. Что э, тоже воздействует на э, 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 здравоохранительную ситуацию этого региона. Кроме этого, в социально-экологическом отчете компания написала, что так как будут привезены из других районов мужчины, работники э, этого рудника, 1800 человек, то э, резко увеличится э, уровень преступности, резко вырастет э, количество венерических заболеваний, и даже начали э, жителям раздавать презервативы. То есть от этого паника и этот протест увеличился, и народ после этого... Да, еще их, их машины делали в результате нарушения автодорожных правил. Несколько человек, несколько аварий было и несколько человек погибли. Вся вода, загрязненная вода в результате аварии на трубопроводе была залита в реку Арпа, и там погибли, например, в этих рыбных фермерствах погибли рыбы. И в результате этого вырос протест у жителей, и после революции как раз народ поверил, что изменилось правительство, оно не коррумпированное, и можно защищать свои права. И они в 2018 году закрыли дорогу к этому руднику. И два с половиной года люди, жители Джермука, День и ночь охраняли эту дорогу. За это время было очень много провокаций со стороны компании, очень много уголовных и административных дел. На передний план шли женщины, чтобы этих провокаций не было, потому что все-таки полиция и охранные эти компании как бы не рискнули поднять руку над женщинами. Первые судебные дела были инициированы женщинами. Они требовали, чтобы Джермук признали э, общиной воздействие. Э, но было безрезультатно. С 2015 -го года у нас э, было э, возбуждено несколько уголовных дел и административных дел в судах. Э, я представляю интересы в двух делах, э, интересы жителей Бендевазы и интересы жителей Джермука. Все э, активисты э, подверглись преследованиям. 
или по делам, это как слаб кейсис, да, или по делам по клевете, или по уголовным делам, или преследуют, стреляли, например, в окно одной журналистки. В общем, очень много преследований со стороны компании по отношению к активистам. Около 30 дел сейчас есть в разных судах по отношению к нашим активистам. И в основном активисты тоже девушки молодые и женщины. Ну, в общем, вы увидите, какой в этом фильме вы увидите, какая прекрасная природа, какая лечебная вода. И в результате вот этой горнорудной деятельности мы потеряем и минеральную воду, потому что в результате этих взрывов могут, может или загрязниться вода, или потеряться. Все питьевые источники высохнут, они уже в своем овосе написали, что Джермук будет лишен питьевой воды, а это... Бальнеологический курорт, где используется вода в основном. И вы представляете, то есть этот курорт просто будет вымирать из-за несколько из-за того, что несколько лет будут якобы Да, я заканчиваю. Ну, в общем, чтобы более видимо было, о чем я говорю, вы все это увидите в нашем фильме. Спасибо за внимание. И мы надеемся, мы будем до конца бороться, мы надеемся, что все-таки правда будет на нашей стороне. Спасибо. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Nazali, for presenting the impact of gold mining on women and um, households in Armenia. Um, I will call all the participants to, um, to read the reports and to have more information about uh, the, the case study. Thank you once again, um, Nazali, for your presentation. We'll now move on to um, Salome from uh, Liberia. Salome, who is uh, the executive director of uh, RICE in uh, Liberia. She will present uh, on the uh, palm oil plantation, the impact of that uh, project on women in Liberia. Salome, you have the floor. Is Salome there, please? Yes, um, I'm here. Fantastic. You have the floor, please. Go ahead. Okay. I'm trying to share my screen. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I'm there, but I needed to share my okay. Okay, um, I wanted to share the screen. Um, uh, Megan, is it possible to, to is it possible to share my screen? Yeah, thank you. And no problem, I can go ahead. Yeah, please start and uh Megan will help us uh, resolve the problem. Okay, all right, so uh as I already have been introduced, I'm Salome Gofa. Uh, I'm from Liberia. I am the executive director for RESI, and currently we are partnering with uh, on the GRE project as the general technical uh, partner in Liberia. So I will be presenting on the, the impact of a large-scale oil palm plantation in Liberia um, on local communities. Um, so after the Liberian uh, civil conflict, um, the government saw uh, the natural resources as the, the means to generate income and to create jobs for its citizens. So the government reverted 
is point in natural resources by entering into uh, concession contracts with uh, different uh, monocultural groups, with mineral uh, companies, logging, and all of that. Um, particularly disregarding that the citizens depend on natural resources, especially the indigenous people. Their survival relies on the natural resources. So um, from 2005, um, where our recovery process began in Liberia, nearly 2 million hectares of forest land have been you know, given into concession, a uh, mini poi plan concession to golden veridium, to the minor uh, oil plan, to sand Davi and other groups. Sade, uh, what was, uh, Invested should be the savior has now become um, a serious threat to communities as community con uh, continue to experience, experience countless uh, social economics and environmental problems, including the, the violations of their rights, um, sexual exploitation and harassment at all levels. Uh, while these things, uh, these impacts are general uh, to the entire communities, there are particular uh, impacts, gender differential impacts that are very much, I you know, immeasurable. So uh, in June, we partner with the GLA and conduct a, a short research in selected communities uh, around the palm oil plantation, mainly looking at the southeastern part of Liberia and, and the northeastern part, I mean, the northwest part where most of the concessions um, are concentrated. And Sale, those two regions, they are the resource rich region in Liberia. When it comes to the forest resources, the animals, um, even um, you know minerals and all of that, the southeast, for example, holds the the biodiversity rich Sapo National Park, which is the first national park, and then provides corridor uh, to so many other uh, rich forests around Liberia. And across Liberia, for example, the Thai National Park in Ivory Coast. We also got the Crown Gribble National Park around there that is globally recognized as a biodiversity hotspot and one of the largest uh, population of uh, critically endangered you know, species, the chimpanzee, the hippopop, and so many other endangered uh, and threatened species are found around there. You know, it also been recognized that over 300 species of fauna and flora uh, plants have been observed in this region. And the northern part, the northwestern part also uh, contain the Gola National Park, uh, which is also a biodiversity rich, is linked to the Ziyama Forest and Guinea, and it's also to the Gola Forest in Ivory Coast, I mean, uh, Sierra Leone. So we did a data collection um, from our research. Uh, our, our secondary data was, uh, we did research of existing documents. And then we also did a primary uh, data collection where we went into communities to talk to uh, people that, are, that live within those concessions. So we talked to women, we talked to youth, we talked to elders. So we found that um, there are a lot of issues, you know, that we, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, basically, um, like I said earlier, we have environmental, social, economic, and human rights violations that are occurring, you know, at a alarming rate in those concessions. The first issue is that 
um, communities were never involved in the, the decision. Government of Liberia traditionally says that the resources on the land belong to the government. So they don't have you know, the guts to make consultation with communities. So the entire effort process was not followed. And as they gave the line to the concessions, government has limitation in even monitoring and setting boundaries. So land grab is also an increase uh, with no remorse to community, whether they have names for livelihood and all of that, the concessions continue to grab additional land to expand. Our people depend on the forest and the resources from the forest as a source of livelihood. So as the concessions grab their land, they have taken away their life, they have taken away their, their income, they have taken away their dignity, they are taking away their culture. Because cultural sites, you know, traditional medicine, and those things our people live on all along have all been taken away. And we also saw that while they promised to provide employment to local communities, they have witnessed you know, illegal dismissal of employees, especially when, you know, when the communities see that uh, there's a violation and they try to claim their rights, the, the next target is to dismiss them. In 2016, we saw this happening in Sandal County where 14 of the employees were dismissed because they were, they were accused of participating in a riot and they were illegally detained for one year without trial. In that process, uh, one person died in, in prison, one female uh, also died during the riot and another person passed shortly one year after they, they released him from prison. There is also increase in sexual uh, uh, child labor. Children have been used to do work that they are not supposed to do in the plantation. There are increase in sexual exploitation. Women livelihood have been taken away. They do not have access to a uh, job. The means of farming is not uh, possible. So men working with the company take advantage of their vulnerability. We also, uh, there was also a report of massive deforestation across the entire landscape. For example, uh, in one of the reports that we saw in 2018, GVL clear some of the high carbon stock area and high uh, conservation value areas in Sino. There were also reports of pollution, uh, chemicals used on the land, out of a fertilizer or uh, herbicides goes into the water bodies and then uh, it also contaminates the, the land. Uh, speaking to the deforestation, you see there that those are some of the photo. The first photo here, you see that this is a high, high for a primary forest that have been cleared. So this is not a secondary forest that was given, but the primary forest within this area is being cleared. And you see that uh, in between there, you see that there was a river here, but because of the exposure of this place, you know, the water body there is being affected. And on the other side, you see that they are expanding the plantation as well. So this is another photo. Uh, I mean, you see the deforestation there, um, cutting down all the high you know, conservation value trees and they, they take forest around there that provide homes to different species. They've all been clear by the concession. 
here you see that um, the GV, GVL also dismissed like the 14 employees I was talking about. Um, when they were arrested, they were assisted by the government. They assigned iron men in their plantation and then, you know, provide security for that plantation, which is also another problem for local communities. So as I said earlier, um, why it is true that this uh, issue affects everyone, the women are more affected because of their gender. Women and other people, uh, people with disability, other marginalized group. During our research, we found that 76% of, uh, of the women, they reported that they lack access to land. Already traditionally, uh, access to land for women in Liberia is, is a difficult thing. And this has been exacerbated by the expansion of oil palm, which also uh, create land shortage for community as a whole, but women especially. And in the employment that was also premised, women are also at a disadvantage. Women are out of place under their husband to work. They are not given independence or to be employed. Uh, in few communities, they have given women some uh, short-term employment, non-employment contracts, uh, especially, particularly when they are doing the, the planting where women are, are, are the one out of doing the preparation of the seeding, uh, applying fertilizer and other chemicals. And other women and people with disability, um, they are not opportune to get anything to do. And at the same time, they do not have land to provide for themselves. The youth uh, boys, mean they mostly are the one who do have the opportunity to get some of the job. So for example, women are exposed to chemical or hazardous work. Like the women told us that they are the one using chemicals, fertilizer. They are not trained on how to use the fertilizer and they are not given any protective gear. And worstly, they are, they are also excluded from decision making. So whatever is decided is either decided by the men and the chiefs and um, the government. And some of the things that women, the women talk about is the, the deforestation has also impacted their, um, their ability to access uh, their traditional medicine. For example, in the communities, they are far away from hospital. So the women use their traditional medicine to do safe delivery, for example. So as you can see here, um, the women here are applying chemicals. They are using um, fertilizer, but they don't have any masks on. There is nothing on their hand, no gloves on their hand. They don't have any safety uh, gear to protect them. So this alone exposes women to a lot of you know, problems. It could be reproductive problem, you know, a long-term health problem. It could be other problems that they may, they may not encounter immediately. Women are also truck. A lot of you know, safety issues. This is how the women are taken to the job. And they have to wake up very early, like around four o'clock in the morning. If you miss this uh, truck, then you have to make your way to the work or you will lose your employment. So those are the so, we'll yeah. Start up, please. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm already done. Um. So uh, basically, um, land grab is an issue. I mean, this is is something that all of us know, and but we are recommending right now in Liberia, the political world is not there because the government see the community as being against development. Uh, and so they are not providing the kind of protection that communities need. 
So we are recommending that uh, we need to build community capacity so that they can claim their own rights. They are able to stand up. We have a sample um, that it happened with the equatorial plan where the communities, when they were supported by SDI, they were able to you know, go into case with uh, the equatorial plan and the became Victoria. We also need to increase advocacy to engage the policymaker to review some of the laws you know, and the policy. For example, the companies, some of the companies, they sign social agreements and MOU with communities, but they are not living to those MOU. So most of the communities, the social services are not even provided. If you see schools that children are attending uh, in those communities, where all the resources and fund and money are coming from, you would, you, I mean, it will surprise you, it will shock you. So we also need to accelerate engagement, you know, for gender just forest governance. Women need to be involved in the process more. So it's about building the capacity of women and working with them to be able to identify their potential and then claim their rights. So uh, now to take your time, thank you. I say, I mean, let's take action, take action to put an end to land grab and the time is now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Salome, for your presentation. Um, I will ask the presenters to uh, look at the chat. Some questions are already uh, on the chat. Uh, question to Salome and question to uh, the first speakers as well. So please check the chat. Um, let's give the floor to Evgenia. Evgenia from uh, yes, Kyrgyzstan. Mm -hmm. Yes, Kyrgyzstan. So mm -hmm. Evgenia, you have the floor for uh, the presentation of the case studies, the yes, impact um, on women. Please go ahead. Much. Would you uh, be so kind to open my presentation? I have sent it to you, to your email or you will- Yes. Yes, yes one we'll, second. We'll, we'll do that. Can you can you start while Shitira will help us uh, in your presentation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank um, you. Hi everyone. I'm Eugenia Pasnova from Akmena Public Association. Uh, so and I prepared this presentation to get, together with my colleague Elena Grosberg, who is uh, providing Russian translation, uh, Russian English today. And also the gender expert uh, of the CEF project uh, in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, this project is realized by the Global Forest Coalition. So there are, uh, as previous speakers, I will um, make a point. Uh, main um, point will be impact on the mining industry on forest uh, gender aspects of the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can start now. So next slide. Yeah, you can see the location I'm going to speak about. It's a place called, called Kazansai. Uh, Kazansai, it's a part of the Kyrgyzstan, Central Asia, and uh, it's a key biodiversity area, so-called key biodiversity area. This means uh, the area with uh, uh, lots of um, beautiful landscapes and rich biodiversity, and uh, including uh, red-listed species of plants and animals, but oh, it's not oh, yeah. protected. Uh, it's not protected by government, it's not national park or so-called Zapovednik or so on. Uh, it's just a place with a, um, a beautiful nature, yeah? And, but the, uh, the problem is that uh, in such beautiful places, in many uh, beautiful places like that, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, there are also <coughs> um, um, uh, they, uh, this, uh, these territories also rich uh, with uh, minerals, including gold and um, other minerals. That's why so uh, people starting uh, start initiatives on extracting this gold. Um, and uh, other elements from the soil, and this uh, damages uh, um, natural landscapes. On the pictures, you can see how beautiful is the nature of Kazansai. And there are uh, lots of endemic fruit plants. Um, uh, by the way, uh, the uh, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan neighboring country is a uh, motherland of all apples in the world. So there are still endemic apple trees 
and also pears and many, many other fruit, uh, uh, fruit uh, plants uh, which are growing in this area. And uh, you can see the picture uh, of the uh, red listed uh, species of plant. Uh, it's a uh, Korzynski uh, pear, um, uh, which is also growing in the territory. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. uh, all uh, economic aspects. Uh, you can see on the picture the unhealed gold mines in the footprint of the Kansansai River. So many, many uh, years ago, people start digging uh, gold here. But only uh, hundred, about 100 years, this impact became very strong. And uh, even this uh, Mm, even this territory, Kazansai, is pretending to be included into UNESCO World Heritage because of these unhit mm, mines. Yeah, it's also uh, several companies, uh, mostly uh, Turkish and China companies who are digging, uh, they're um, making their um, making their activities uh, right uh, nearby the Kazansai River, and this uh, strongly impact on uh, food plain forests. Uh, of the uh, local ecosystem. So the conflict between uh, uh, the uh, interest of the local population and also the, uh, the companies are uh, very strong in Kazansai. Next slide, please. You can see, uh, so what, what are these landscape now? You saw the original landscapes of the Kazansai river and all these fruit trees and so on. And you can see what is it picture now? Of course, uh, it's not proper way of doing business, of doing the scenes. Uh, so what has happened is the um, uh, local, um, local population of the Chatkala region, especially the uh, village uh, right near the Kazansai Kibai area, started protesting against such activities. Uh, uh, according uh, as, uh, as uh, very, uh, comparing with Armenia, it's very very similar what is happening in Kazakhstan. It's also a dust influence on health. Uh, it's also influence on uh, women groups uh, here, women uh, and uh, youth because they lose jobs. Uh, so I will not uh, stop on this uh, because it's very similar, like uh, um, colleague from Armenia described. Uh, yeah, and you also see that the mountain slopes with disturbed vegetation become a source of dust and also emergency situations. Uh, um, this summer we have got uh, a very uh, problematic, um, uh, a, a big campaign in our mass media uh, where we, um, uh, where uh, many mass media uh, reported about cases about the local school who was damaged because of the explosions of the local company. No children uh, suffered, but it's a, it, it, it was very, very uh, dangerous for them. Uh, teacher uh, and the uh, children were saved, but uh, that could be victims. Even, even more explosions could, could be done, yeah? So uh, uh, now it's uh, dangerous for people, health, and even lives. Next slide, please. Uh, what was our actions to support local populations against these improper actions, improper business? Yeah. So within the projects of the under support of the critical ecosystem foundations, um, so uh, which is realized by the Global Forest Coalition and is called Biodiversity Protection and Key Areas for Biodiversity Conservation in the Central Asia region. region. So we conducted the uh, community meeting uh, May on May, uh, and uh, also the, um, we created an initiative group. You can see the members of this initiative groups, uh, group uh, on the photo. Uh, so that was uh, not so many women uh, on, the uh, on the first workshop. You can see that was 26 uh, participants and only six women, but we hope we will raise uh, the participation of women and our gender specialist is now working on this. Based on the results of the workshop, the main, the main areas of work in the key territory of biodiversity, Kazansai, uh, for the next uh, years uh, were determined. And we also identified the leaders. What we are going to do, next slide please. 
Uh, you can see the photo of the uh, local uh, active uh, women group and uh, her team. Uh, the name of the leader is Bartina Etabaeva. And uh, we uh, working with this uh, um, community leader and her team. Uh, we are going to establish a, di a dialogue with the gold mine company, first of all, Etibatir company, and request a reclamation plan from them in order to organize uh, a public discussion of this plan. Because now people complain that they don't know about uh, reclamation plan and what are the plans of the company on uh, uh, further restoration of the territories after they finalize the uh, um, uh, uh, gold extraction activities. Then we are going to organize expeditions of the scientists from the National Academy of Science of Kyrgyzstan. It will happen, I hope, in September this year in order to mark the places uh, where the Korzynski red book pier grows. And through this red list species, we can protect a part of this territory because a company will uh, have to pay a compensation if they damage the red list species. Uh, we also planning, usually with the voluntary support of this company, uh, um, that will uh, start uh, steps to minimize damage and restore the floodplain ecosystems in Kazansai uh, uh, Kyiv biodiversity area. Uh, there is uh, a positive examples uh, of the um, companies who are working with the population, not uh, against to each other uh, nearby. And we're going to invite people who have good stories and uh, uh, show Eti Batir company that uh, positive way of cooperation with the population is uh, possible. And the, last, and the last slide, please. Um, we are going to uh, start um, from the local uh, cases, so positive cases uh, suggested by community people themselves. You can see uh, the areas who has already been uh, who have already been uh, reclaimed by the populations themselves. Uh, there is a local group of uh, forest uh, under, um, under man, uh, so the, the main man, manager of the activity is a forester, local forester, uh, and uh, this team restore a big part of the territory which was um, damaged previously by the Edelweiss company. You see, they have uh, they have uh, established uh, or put the fan, and also there are many seedlings uh, here, young seedlings, which are uh, now around the uh, around the river. You also can see the uh, a lot of. Uh, Evgenia, will you please speak slowly for the interpreters? Yes. Yes, you can also see there are lots of uh, small seedlings of the red uh, listed species, which were grown by hands of local women and uh, children. And we also plan to uh, start uh, working with the local school who will collect uh, seeds of the red listed, uh, red -listed uh, species of uh, pear and apples uh, in the region during the expeditions this September or October this year. And one more interesting um, finding is, uh, you can see the pond on the photo. It's not usual pond. Uh, it was organized uh, on the place uh, where before it was a big, uh, a big uh, holes or damaged landscapes uh, by uh, created by activities uh, of the gold mining uh, companies, and uh, interesting, the local uh, population uh, developed the method of how to create pond in this uh, in such territories, and we saw um, beautiful. Uh, ponds and potash in their capacity of growing fish in such places. And uh, this is also the way to support local green business. So there are several, several uh, ways on how we can build up on um, experience and findings of the local population in Kazansai and how we can create, uh, on how we can reclaim areas and restore areas. And that would be great if we will get success uh, with support of the company. Um, so we don't know, we 
uh, about the results. Uh, we are on the way uh, and hope uh, we will will do our best to follow this uh, uh, to follow these plans. So here um, the main um, since I wanted to share with you. Uh, I hope in next uh, meetings I will uh, be able to report about progress and draw some um, uh, contacts of the local coordination groups and the women group who are um, active in uh, uh, these reclamation activities of uh, forest in Kazansai. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Virginia, for your presentation. Um, we have uh, two more presentations to go, uh, short presentations. I will give the floor first to uh, David, Dev, Dev, Dev. yes, from India. <laughs> I hope I pronounced very well your, your, your name. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you, you have the floor for uh, yeah. the case study from India. Thank yeah. you. Hello everyone, I am Devjit from India and basically I am going to talk on the mining pro extraction project in one of the forest areas in Chhattisgarh that is central part of India. The slide show is not working I think, ah, yeah. Uh, this is the area which was previously uh, having a lot of biodiversity and now it has turned into whole mining, uh, about 1,70,000 hectares of land uh, is the Hasdevaranya forest area, uh, which is being demolished due to mining and destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Area is uh, Hasdevaran area is a large forest intact area, which is in central part of India, and it is one of the biggest uh, forest area which is outside the protected areas in the central India. Others are protected areas, but this this area is outside the for, uh, protected area, uh, one and one of the biggest uh, forest area which have been turned into mining. Uh, and this spreads over our, around 2,000 square kilometers and, and uh, of forest area, which is which has now been given to 23 coal blocks uh, in this forest area, and it is around 350 species of animals. The coal fields cover around uh, same uh, 1879 square kilometer of area, and this uh, is falls in three districts, Korba, Sarbuja, and Surajpur, the three different districts. And if we see the whole area, which was previously 80% of the whole area was good forest cover, around for more than 40% of the canopy was there. And additional 70% uh, uh, over uh, additional 116 square kilometers had uh, canopy over 70% of forest area. So you can understand this is a very rich in biodiversity. And it is also one of the biggest uh, elephant, wild elephant corridor in the central part of India, uh, which is again being de uh, destructed and uh, uh, causing problems for the ele elephant to translocate due to mine mining coming up and large pits coming up. So wild elephant and elephants are going in different areas. So that is another sort of problem coming now. And the whole area, 90% of the area is uh, 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 in, inhabited by uh, indigenous community who are dependent on agriculture as well as forest products. Uh, the region is again a watershed region. It has a big uh, dam called uh, Hasdeo or uh, Bango Reservoir, which uh, irrigates about 3 lakh hectares of agricultural land. So that is also being uh, uh, destroyed due to this mining and the water being taken by the mining companies. Uh, this mining company is again a big shot in India nowadays, the Adani Mining Company. Uh, 
uh, which which uh, extracts coal from uh, from this place and um, the power plant is in based in uh, Rajasthan, which is about uh, 2,000 kilometers away from Chhattisgarh. So they make about uh, 4,500 uh, megawatt of electricity in Rajasthan from by extracting coal from this area. So uh, and about 17 to 20 percent of Rajasthan's electricity is made by mining in Chhattisgarh. So you can understand the people. In this area, they have a lot of NTFP in the area, and they it was in abundance in of NTFP, and there are also forest dependent communities. They make ropes, mats, and uh, bamboo baskets, and all these things. So this, and then there being an indigenous community, the whole worshiping place is inside the forest. So these are all disrupted due to all these things, and some around forty thousand trees have been cut. And more than 7,000 families have been displaced due, uh, uh, presently due to the mining uh, project. This, this is a photo which I will come back later. The women have now stalled the project by, uh, you know, the Chipko movement, which was a Gandhian movement in India. And the, the women uh, hugged the trees and then they saved the whole mining. Now the second phase was stalled due to women's intervention. So what has been the impact of my, uh, mining on uh, the women in the area has been that uh, they are the worst affected uh, the, in the whole process of mining and compensation. They have never been consulted. No process of EPIC was uh, discussed in the whole uh, mining area and, and the mining process. Even many of the women, they don't know how much compensation has been paid, how much have been paid. So you can understand that there has been very negligible participation of them. Uh, most of the women being minor uh, collectors of forest producers, and now the forest firewood have gone away. So they have to collect firewood walking to around 1.5 to 2 kilometers every day to collect the firewood. And also another problem is that due to lesser firewood, the theft of coal has again started. So they are facing more suffocation, more punishment, more har harassment due to all being branded as thieves and all these things. So that is another problem for them. The water table has gone uh, very highly, uh, low, low, has gone very low. And the traditional women water sources have become more polluted. The wells, the their traditional water sources have been is all uh, polluted. And now they have to stand in queues for drinking water from the supply from the company water taps, which is mostly for common people over there. So that's another problem for them. Uh, the cleaning of houses, which is mostly women's job in that area and the cleaning of clothes, they are now very frequent due to dust and all this thing, my mining dust and all this thing has gone up. So that is a put extra load of work for the women uh, to them. The mining compensation for land is also very low and it is only given to men in their men, in the men's account in their men, and men operate the whole my mining compensation. So now women have depend everything uh, for money on men. And uh, NTFP, which was a major source of cash income from for women uh, for the welfare of house, like education of children, for their health needs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are all gone out of the hands of women. So they have to ask every time for, from men for money. We also see a lot of migration of men out of the area. Women have also started migrating, but men, men are migrating more and more. So women, they have to deal with whole responsibility of household chores, uh, even livelihood to support their houses, the house uh, education needs, health needs, food needs, everything. So you can understand the whole sort of problems increasing uh, for women. 
Mm. Then uh, due to uh, all this thing, the traditional status of women, uh, because she has to face everything alone, everything, most of the men of the of their own community, of their own village has gone out. So they felt a lot of other harassments uh, uh, because a lot of outsiders have come in due to mining company and due to laborers have come in. Uh, they have rented houses in their villages and all these things. So uh, they face a lot of sexual abuse, alcoholism has increased in that area a lot. Uh, violence on women has increased a lot. So they, the women, the particularly the uh, tribal women who had a respectable um, uh, position in their uh, society, are now aware, there are a lot of harassment of them. So there is a lot uh, impact on them. There, then the kinship of family has also broken up due to migration, due to all this harassment and all this thing. They are, my women are being left out uh, 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 and either those who go for my, uh, migration do second marriages or those women who are raped or who are uh, face sexual harassment are left out. So the, the, these are all problems which we are uh, viewing, uh, seeing in that area. Another thing is that uh, uh, the employment provided by the companies are on, mostly given to men, not not uh, to women. So they are uh, they. Uh, they are forced to do manual tasks or, st or steal coal for uh, their livelihoods and all these things. So their st social status has gone down and their recognized roles as uh, collectors of forests, as uh, conservators of uh, forests have uh, totally wiped out in that area. So women feel alone and they have a psychological effect on them. The cultural impact is also there they cannot go to the forest the forest is all wiped out so that's another uh, problem for them uh, there is no scope for the pregnant women or lactating women in the whole uh, uh, displacement issue in the whole compensation program there is no role for pregnant women whether she is pregnant or lactating women there is no role their health is also severely affected to a lot of smokes uh, burning of coal and suffocating order and uh, order and all these things. The, even the girl child who, whose school have gone away, gone far uh, from their uh, original villages, uh, have left their education. And we also see a lot of early marriages uh, being done in that area. So these are all um, uh, impacts that are in the area. Then another uh, thing is that since uh, though, though India is said to be uh, ODF, uh, open defecation free country, but it's clearly visible in the villages. So we still have uh, defecation outside in the forest area. Uh, and, and women, they have to, they have very difficulty to uh, uh, go for answering the nature's call in broad daylight because there are many outsiders there are many uh, people who don't know the moment so they have to wait up till uh, it becomes dark to go outside and they have to grow in grow, go in groups not alone they cannot go alone so this is another problem and also the elephant attacks yes. there has been few, can, few elephant can attacks. you start uh, wrapping up please yeah yeah there are few elephant attacks uh, very recent so uh, that is also there. So, so these are all the impact on the women. Thank you for patiently listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devjit, for uh, presenting the Indian case study. Uh, let's move on to the final presentation uh, from Yuli. Yuli will be presenting the impacts of Belt and Road Initiative projects. Uh, on women and communities. Um, Yuli, you have the floor, please. Okay, Kwame, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Yuli from Sarbi Indonesia Institute from Indonesia. Uh, thank you, and I hope you all is well and God always bless us. 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity for uh, our new organization to present uh, our new study, especially on the BRR project in Indonesia. This project located uh, located in the North Kalimantan, uh, especially in Bulungan uh, district. So most of the uh, people who stay in this area is the, the Dayak. Uh, especially is Dayak Kenya, we call it. The next uh, slide, please. Okay, the Kayan River hydropower plants is the uh, BRI project in Indonesia, which uh, they plan to build five dams. With total area is 190,600 hectare. And this uh, electricity uh, estimated with will be provide 9,000 megawatt for the not only for Indonesia but also for uh, Sarawak and Sabah area. So uh, based on our uh, preliminary research, that uh, the project itself will uh, change the landscape and the livescape of the uh, North uh, Kalimantan because uh, maybe you already knew that. Kalimantan is the last frontier of the tropical forest in Indonesia. Uh, but not only the landscape uh, that we have a big concern about it, but also the livescape. Since the uh, North Kalimantan or the Dayak's uh, indigenous people is, uh, they have uh, mother life age, uh, more high uh, status, beside the men. So uh, women in the Dayak uh, have a big uh, contribution on the family life or in the community life. The next uh, slide, please. So in this uh, slide, you see that uh, Dayak's woman rule in the prosthetic of the forest they uh, very engage with the forest on the daily activity. The first one is they task to collecting water for the household needs. So this automatically uh, push uh, the woman, the Dayak woman, to protect the water source on the forest. And then the second one, they uh, they task is to plan fertilizing and harvesting the foods for the family or for the community itself, uh, which is the men only prepare the land and prepare the whole, but the planting should be made by the woman. Uh, that's why when they uh, the projects is uh, built in the area and they must be displaced from another place, then uh, this uh, task will be difficult to be implemented. And then they also very engage with the uh, estate activity, especially for the rubber. This uh, activity is not specifically on the North Kalimantan area, but uh, mostly in South Kalimantan or West Kalimantan. And then the Fifth uh, task is the they use the NTFP product from the plant like rattan or bamboo for uh, the daily tools. I think uh, the five one is uh, this the most uh, usual activity for every woman in the world is uh, cooking and preparing food. But this is very engaged with the second task where when they need uh, land and they need uh, forest to prepare all the food for the family and the uh, communities. So when the project of BRI implemented in this area, automatically uh, the, they will be displaced to another area where is the forest is not there. And this give uh, cultural shock or psychological shock to the woman because they cannot do their tasks. The next slide, please. 
So uh, as I said that uh, the project impact on the Daya Commons is uh, they cannot uh, do what they usually do as a woman. And they also uh, have to adjust or have the psychological impact because of the reallocated to another place where they cannot find any forest in the new place. And then uh, the loss of the forest area and reallocations, uh, it uh, makes them uh, very difficult to adjust uh, on life. And then uh, the cultural shock itself will be affected uh, to uh, the program or the psychological uh, family growth in the area. So uh, what we can do now is since uh, our uh, governments already have uh, constitutions about the indigenous people, we a little bit grateful because uh, the Dayak woman will get the opportunity to uh, have a sound or have a, a opportunity to tell what they expected to do to the company when they implemented the project on the area. But uh, based on what we get from the field, uh, their expectations is, can you please uh, help me with the last uh, slide, please? So what we can advise for the BRI to be responsible uh, when they implemented the uh, project in the North Kalimantan is uh, we expected the BRI to comply with the state regulations, not only uh, the formal one, but also the corporate social and environmental responsibility, which is uh, the implementations of the GSR or the uh, should be measurable, transparent, and uh, no one is left behind, especially a woman, because a uh, woman will be the one who taking a lot of uh, contribution for not only their family, but also uh, to the community. And then uh, BRI, I think, should also provide the environmental group, which is the woman, activi uh, woman activists who work to develop a program uh, to decrease or to uh, accommodate the uh, psychological uh, shock that uh, already got by the Dayak woman to uh, make them back to uh, nature. Even the forest is not there, but uh, maybe need a long time to make a new forest in the new area, something like that. But uh, this is uh, what we can do to uh, the woman in Dayak, I think right now, because uh, this project is become the national strategic project for Indonesia. So we cannot say no to the government. What we can do now is uh, we encouraging you all maybe can help us or can also being a BRR watch in the each new host country for the civil society forum who can also speak up for uh, for the local community, especially for the woman. And next we are plan to have a literation, especially for information for this uh, Dayak a woman. I think that's uh, the short presentation from me and hopefully it will be useful useful for all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Yuli, for your presentation. It's very clear how uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is impacting um, women and, and, and forests. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation. Right now, we still have some time. I see uh, we can respond to one of the questions. Uh, 
other questions have been responded in the chat. Um, so um, one person is asking, do you think the international conventions can help for action and pledge, such as climate convention, biodiversity, and the recent UN resolution about the right to clean, healthy, and sustainable environments, or are these international texts and negotiations too theoretical to be useful? So the questions from one of the participants, um, are you, you inspired to respond quickly to this, um, to this question? Uh, who is uh, willing to just give a word? Uh, uh, to respond to this question. <laughs> Nazali, you yeah, want to try? Yes, yeah, if we can. Yeah. Uh, on the campaign convention, the secretary of the convention, of course, they have no impact on the government, but on the national level, they have, of course, an impact влияние, хотя не всегда эффективны. Например, по Амурсару мы обратились в Орхусскую конвенцию, и они направили как бы предупреждение нашему правительству. Мы обратились в конвенцию по охране дикой природы, Бернскую конвенцию, потому что это эмиральд зона. И секретариат направил письмо в правительство и потребовал, чтобы прекратили там эти горнорудную промышленность, деятельность, но наше государство ответило, правительство ответило, что мы исключим дерьмо из списка Эмиральд Зон. В ответ секретариат ответил, что Армения вошла с 15 эмиральд зонами в эту конвенцию, стала стороной конвенции, и никаких изменений мы не имеем права делать сейчас в этом процессе. Кроме того, там зарегистрировано 54 памятников истории бронзового и каменного века, И мы обратились в конвенцию через ЮНЕСКО, в конвенцию по охране исторического и культурного наследия. Они ответили, что да, эти объекты под их охраной, но мы должны пройти бюрократическую процедуру через наше представительство ЮНЕСКО. Мы подали заявку, обратились к комиссару ООН по правам человека и в течение часа четырех месяцев, пока ответы не получили. Это жители Дермука обратились, и активисты. В общем, мы да, обратились финансовым организациям, потому что Лидиан International финансировали международные финансовые корпорации. И в 2017 году мы подали заявку, подали жалобу на деятельность этой компании IFC, Международная финансовая корпорация группы World Bank. И они прекратили финансирование, и Биарды не прекратила. В 2017 году ничего не сделала. И сейчас только начали, они начали compliance activity, то есть изучают нарушения законодательства, нарушения международных стандартов. И предварительно нам сказали, что заключение будет вот на днях. И международные э, организации по правам человека тоже заинтересованы и занимаются этим. Например, Bank Watch Network приготовил репорт э, по нарушениям прав человека в, по мусорскому делу. Так что э, наши активисты и мы очень активно э, э, работаем с международными организациями и секретариатами конвенции. И э, есть какие-то результаты. Не всегда, но есть какие-то результаты. Спасибо.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Nazali, for that. Um, Yuli, you have uh, a question. Uh, that, that will be the last question, uh, I suppose. Uh, you have a question in the chat. As I understand, the question is from Helena. As I understand it, China chooses to believe that indigenous peoples do not exist, certainly in China, perhaps elsewhere too. So how, therefore, will China's Belt and Road Initiative projects address the issue properly? Okay, thank you, Helena. That's why on my presentation, I. I said that uh, we still a little bit grateful because our uh, country is, is already have a constitution, especially for indigenous people. So our entry point to talk with the BRI uh, investor in Indonesia, which is they have a cooperation with the private sector in Indonesia. So we can push uh, them to apply all the regulations based on Indonesian governments, like it or not, uh, for the uh, social or even environmental regulation in Indonesia, they should apply because their partner in Indonesia is the Indonesian companies. So they cannot specifically reduce uh, to, uh, to apply with any regulation that already uh, Indonesian have. Besides that, we also uh, want to engage with the Chinese peer. Uh, which also have a uh, same concern with us, not only about the uh, sustainable uh, natural resource, but also about the uh, financial is issue. Because uh, I think the big point also about the BRI investment in many country in the world is about how the investor should be understand, should be acknowledged. Uh, any uh, social or indigenous peoples or environmental uh, issue is important to be uh, to become a point that they have to include it on the uh, process costs. So uh, based on our uh, communication with many uh, financial, uh, coalitions in Europe, we think that uh, what we can do also with the BRI in China uh, country is we have to uh, have the soft engagement with them so uh, they, they can also uh, accept that uh, the indigenous people where the dam will be uh, built is most the uh, important uh, actor that they should count off. That's maybe, uh, I, I hope uh, it can answer your question, Helena. Thank you. Thank you, Yuli, uh, for throwing the answer. And I'm sure the discussion is uh, a continuous discussion um we'll be discussing it and if you read the report and you have a question please just drop uh, your question on your website on our website and we'll 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 get back to you um i will now hand over to um valentina for the closing remark yes. um so valentina you have the floor hello everybody i'm valentina figuera martinez i am the gender justice and forest coordinator for the Global Forest Coalition. I'm from Venezuela, but I'm based in Brazil. Today, I'm gonna give these closing remarks and try to wrap up some of the main um, recurring concepts that were brought up today. So the first thing that I would like to um, remark is the fact of that power structure that was underlined at the beginning of the presentation by Ali. And this is important because it leads us to understand extractivism, not only as an isolated um, dispositive, but also as an intersectional, you know, um, a concept or access aspect. It's not only about extracting, you know, um, large quantities of natural resources, 
but all that comes behind it, which implies colonialism, um, um, you know, um, the hierarch hierarchization of relations, not only in the forest, but in many aspects that were underlined here, here. And also emphasize on that question that was raised, why um, gender and why feminism? And we can discover, you know, from the um, case studies that we listen today, that the most impacted on the on these, you know, um, hegemonic structures and, and extractivist projects are women. And despite the fact that they are the most impacted, they are the, the ones that suffer the most, right? So one thing that we have to um, discuss. Uh, widely and in not only in our groups but, but but you know as a society at all is um the fact that ecofeminism is is a model of resistance this is a word that i actually you know think is very valuable valuable for today's um event you know the act of resisting because all these cases that were brought up today show us that resistance is still the answer to keep continue fighting against the oppression of, of these dispositives. So um, I just wanted to quickly wrap up some of the um, aspects that we're um, underlined today. So we got some gender aspects uh, regarding the cases. Uh, for example, Naceli, um, uh, she wrote up that, you know, women, they are the ones who protect the, the pear and apple, um, endemic apples, and they are the most concentrated on, on protected, protecting forests, of, of course. They are also the most impacted by oncological um, conditions. You know, these would go to, to, to also link um, uh, in, in other aspects of, of impact too. But gender, you know, usually intersects not only the gender sphere, but only um, the socioeconomic, the environmental, and so on and so on. So, for example, um, Salome from Liberia, I, um, she also I highlighted some of the socioeconomic impacts, like increasing land grab, which was also present in some other of the case studies. So this is an aspect that is, you know, recurring in our case studies. Livelihood so sources are destroyed, poverty, you know, also a socioeconomic impacts, work conflicts increase, child labor, gender-based ba violence. And um, uh, Eugenia from Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan uh, highlighted the, the, the um, you know, some vegetation impacts and the destruction of food plain and ecosystems. So all these uh, interconnected uh, impacts in different um, parts of the world also leave us to understand this phenomenon as a, as a joint community. I mean, we are very segregated in geographically speaking, but we also have the same um, problems, of course, with different contexts. But this is important to understand and to research on a specific and concrete solutions. And one of the, you know, um, four aspects of it is about listening to indigenous communities, to listening to local people who are on the ground working, protecting, as all research, research has showed historically, to protect forests and, of course, the livelihoods, livelihoods that, you know, go around uh, forests. So we also, I would also like to, hi, uh, like to highlight uh, something that was quite uh, per, uh, recurrent in the, in the cases, which was mental health impacts regarding food security, for example, in India, no proper care of pregnant women in, in you know, that, that, that are forest dependent. Um, uh, I also uh, highlight um, from Indonesia, the fact that, you know, the community of women were shocked about the fact that their livelihoods, livelihoods were impacted so tremendously by these um, hydroelectric power plants. So basically, we have you know several spheres: gender impacts, economic impacts. You know, compensation are usually given to women, and this recreates 
another power structure, you know, domestically. We have socioeconomic impacts such as alcoholism, sexual abuse, gender-based violence, employment um, conflicts, mental health, as I said, you know, and also environment, environmental impacts, we were, which were some of the you know, most highlighted today. So I would like to close in recalling to one of the, the speakers who, you know, uh, I think it's important to, um, to promote this capacitation or this training that Salome from Liberia highlighted as a, you know, as an action that we should take. And this, this capaci capacitation, if we think about, you know, historically about feminism and gender goes right, you know, with, a, with the fact that we were fighting as a woman to, you know, to have more access to education to everybody so everybody could be liberated. And this capaci capacitation and education has to be put it in the table supporting you know prior knowledge and supporting the um traditional knowledge that people has and not taking this you know um as a mechanism of you know uh reproducing hierarchization of knowledge too but also valuing the local communities knowledge so i just want to you know take this uh, salome's uh, words and say let's take action Let's continue working, let's continue researching, let's continue fighting for our territories, for gender-based analysis and lenses that can lead us to propose, not only in a community sphere, but also on an international level and other you know, aspects that we are allowed to, our, our truth and our facts. So thank you, Kwame, and I hope you can, you know, have access to the report and uh, congratulations to all of the presenters and all of the, you know, editors that were involved in the, in the work. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. We will not give up until victory. Hasta la victoria siempre. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, I would like to thank everyone, every participant. Thank you for joining our webinar. With this, we launch our report, Forest Cover 67, uh, which is already on our website. Please uh, read it. And as I said, if you have any questions, just drop in the comment your questions and we'll get back to you. Thank you once again for joining interpreters. Thank you so much. You help us understand each other and uh, you help us uh, uh, in this successful webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Megan, Shitira, Valentina. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ali. Thank, thank you, you for yeah. all presenting. Bye bye. Bye, bye bye. bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.